if you are looking at this page uh, here, we have a, a, a simple text. Uh, you can see we have this speaker recommendation form. Uh, you can fill it in to recommend the speakers. Uh, we welcome speakers from both research and operational communities. Um, we are at the beginning to use this uh, go to webinar tools. Uh, please be patient with us. Uh, we are going to try to limit the talk within 40 minutes, leave uh, uh, some time for questions. Uh, please fill in the questions uh, in the question box so we can uh, do the question and answer uh, at the end. Uh, let me first uh, invite Dr. Shangjo uh, Kandruganto to introduce today's speaker. Um, he's the program manager for GTTI. Shangjo, this is to you. Good. Thanks, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Right? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Good, good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Curtis Alexander. Uh, Curtis got his bachelor's degree from the famous uh, Penn State University, uh, and then master's and PhD from the Oklahoma University, PhD in 2010. Uh, Curtis joined the Global Systems Lab of Azrael Nova, first as a Cooperative Institute employee through Ceres uh, University of Colorado uh, in 2009, and then as a federal employee in 2016, and then moved up quickly and became the Division Chief for the Assimilation and Verification Innovation Division in 2017. So he focused his research on several aspects of uh, uh, the convective scale modeling and uh, significantly uh, advanced the convective scale modeling capability in NOAA. Uh, he is very successful in transitioning research to operations. So between 2014 and 2020, he helped transition several versions of the RAP, uh, rapid refresh and uh, high resolution rapid refresh models into the NSEP uh, National Weather Service operations. He's also very successful in uh, getting his proposals funded. Uh, he is a PI and, uh, and co PI on several of the research and research to operations uh, uh, projects, uh, including the JTTI and the US Weather Research Program. Uh, he co leads the short range weather convection allowing model application team under the just funded UFS R2 proposal. So, you know, as you can see, you know, he's a very busy person. Despite his uh, busy schedule, he kindly agreed to give a talk in the UFS webinar series today. Uh, the title of his talk is uh, uh, The Unified Forecast System Short Range Weather Application for Convection Allowing Model Forecasts. So, with that, uh, Kadis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chandra. Uh, Curtis, I'm going to give you the presentation. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I just made it present. Uh, okay, great. Okay. Uh, let's see if you can you see my uh, slides with that presentation. Yes. Mode. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to um, provide a, a, a sort of an update on where we're at in the unified forecast system efforts with a short range weather application. Um, and again, with the eye toward convection allowing model forecasts. So um, this is a large effort. A lot of people are involved. Uh, and I certainly want to acknowledge several co-authors here um, that are contributing. Um, Jacob Carley, uh, Jamie Wolf, Jeff Beck, Lou Wicker, to name a few. Um, but there's a lot of people that are in the mix um, to help move this uh, UFS effort forward for, like I said, short range, short range weather applications and convective allowing model forecasts. So what I wanna do is um, try to cover quite a bit of material here to give uh, this audience an idea of where we're at in the development of this application for the UFS, uh, some of the initial capabilities and testing and evaluation that's been going on, and then with an eye toward um, researched operations transitions for this type of application, um, and then finally, some science challenges that I think exist uh, at the convective allowing scales that uh, are certainly inherent across uh, any sort of weather application uh, that, that's dealing with the convective processes and their forecasts. So 
um, I'll try to, to hit those notes toward the end here as I step through this. So um, I guess I'll proceed, and I think there's a, pl a procedure in place here for handling questions in the uh, chat area that we'll get to toward the end of the, the presentation. So thank you again. Um, and I'm just going to step through some high-level stuff first, and I think this audience knows this, but just to reiterate in case you don't, um, Unified Forecast System um, obviously is viewed as this community-based um, comprehensive Earth modeling capability that's going to span applications across time and space scales. Uh, the predict predictive time scales, um, certainly from sub-hourly analyses to seasonal predictions, the emphasis of this presentation is going to be on the shorter time scales and the finer um, resolutions and those applications. So I'll certainly be spending my time on that subject today. Um, obviously, this is just, uh, this capability should should support a broad um, spectrum of users and stakeholders across the weather enterprise, um, and certainly a source for our operational numerical weather prediction and really Earth system prediction um, going forward. There's a lot of infrastructure that's uh, being uh, established as part of the unified forecast system that's going to allow us to uh, evaluate the performance of the system, whether it's data simulation applications, uh, model physics, um, or the dynamic core, um, which in this case, um, we've selected FE3 for uh, well, obviously the global and now being tested on the regional applications here. Um, we are going to be transitioning to JEDI for the data simulation foundations of UFS, uh, and again, physics suite. Um, there are several um, that are gonna be used currently in different UFS applications, but obviously there's an interest in um, scale awareness attributes of a physics suite that may work both, um, again, at the shorter time scales, uh, small spatial scales, as well as the longer um, sub-seasonal to seasonal predictions. But that's one of the challenges scientifically that we have to move in that direction. So. Um, again, I'm going to focus principally on the UFS applications that are really on the short-term time scale of the next several hours to days, and so that's the emphasis here, the short-range weather uh, CAM application team efforts, or SRW slash CAM, um, and so those are the systems that I'm going to highlight, uh, one of which is known as the Rapid Refresh Forecast System, or RRFS. Uh, there's also a Warn-On Forecast System, and then there's other downstream CAM applications um, that are certainly going to play a role as the UFS evolves in the future. Um, and so, like I said, my emphasis is going to remain um, principally on describing the uh, rapid refresh forecast system, uh, again, where we're at with existing CAM applications and the efforts toward transitioning to this unified approach. So there's quite a few um, CAM forecast systems um, that are being established as applications, again, for predictive grid spacings on, on the order of three kilometers or finer. Uh, again, forecast updates on the, hour, on the um, cadence of 15 minutes up to several hours. Um, we're focusing on sub-global domains, um, principally CONUS or sub-CONUS, um, but not exclusively. We certainly have some outside CONUS interests at this scale, uh, as well as oceanic basin, basins for um, tropical applications. Again, my focus is going to be on uh, really describing the rapid refresh forecast system uh, and the underlying model development that's taking place in what's known as a standalone regional FE3 um, uh, model, system, or SAR for short. Um, obviously, the DA and the transitions operations are tentative, but uh, we're looking at trying to make the first UFS CAM application go operational um, nominally in the second quarter of FY23, so still several years out. Um, and we'll see how things progress for that particular front with other systems targeted uh, at other time tape or time scales down the road. So as I mentioned, uh, the rapid refresh forecast systems based um, on the standalone regional FE3 system. The intent is for it to be rapidly updating, uh, of course, convection allowing at three kilometers, likely leveraging ensemble data simulation on the order of dozens of members, probably 40 or so. Um, we would produce ensemble forecasts with this system, so it's both a deterministic and an ensemble system, um, nominally to time horizons of at least 18 hours, uh, and, and then out further to towards 60 hours um, every six to 12 hours. Uh, and again, these are notional uh, and may be refined as, as things progress um, with the development and evaluation of compute resources. And uh, we are going to try to replace quite a few existing operational model systems that are run regionally, whether they be the NAM or the RAP or the higher resolution HER, or the NAM uh, nests, uh, as well as HREF 
And I'll talk quite a bit about some of those challenges coming up as well. So this is a interrelationship diagram or wiring diagram between these uh, current uh, modeling systems that are in operations with NCEP. Uh, and obviously it's a complicated um, and but historical uh, legacy of how we've reached this point of having multiple regional uh, mesoscale modeling systems like the RAP and the NAM, uh, and then several uh, high resolution systems, again, down at sort of the three to four kilometer grid spacing, and then even a sub uh, one kilometer or near one kilometer um, on demand type uh, system with the Fireweather Nest. And so this does mean there's a lot of compute resources and re, um, duplicative uh, compute resources, management of multiple dynamic cores and all the development that goes into that, uh, that we would like to simplify and consolidate and in this unification process um, to I mean, better use the, use the resources we have and produce fewer higher quality applications as part of the operational suite. So um, we want to transition to basically this kind of paradigm where we have a global system um, that runs uh, you know, at least four times per day, potentially more frequently than that at a future date. Um, but then have this unified rapid refresh forecast system that covers CONUS and then some outside CONUS areas, again, running notionally hourly um, with ensemble forecasts subsetted from that um, upwards of perhaps four times per day, and then a finer resolution one kilometer uh, worn-on forecast system, uh, at least in its initial operation, operating capability. So we have to basically subsume and replace a lot of existing operational modeling systems, and there's some science challenges that are certainly in front of us to make that happen. Um, this is, I think, shown in the previous UFS webinar, um, but one of the uh, notional uh, schematics um, from NCEP on how the current operational model suite would evolve toward a uh, fewer number of model systems and applications. Uh, as you note, as we move it forward in time toward the right side, you'll see a consolidation down towards uh, just a global uh, and then a short range application that's regional based uh, with a few other uh, application-specific capabilities alongside that, but far fewer uh, in, in the you know, FY24 plus time frame than we have now. Um, so we are focusing here in blue on consolidation of quite a few of these existing systems. I'll talk a little bit more about these um, with uh, the final implementation of the HER, HER version 4, the final imp implementation of the uh, high-resolution ensemble forecast system, or HREF version 3, uh, there's an analysis system I'm not going to talk much about here today, um, the RTMA IRMA, um, and then uh, the uh, hurricane application. So again, I'm going to focus on really the consolidation of the high-res windows, NAM nests, wrap her HREP into this RFS system uh, as one of the, as the first UFS short-range application. So again, just to reiterate, background again on motivation for having high resolution forecast in general, because yes, they are computationally expensive, and I will get to that in a minute, but obviously we want to depict conductive scale processes that you simply can't do with the current global uh, model systems that have grid spacings on the order of 12 or 13 kilometers uh, or coarser, and that includes some regional mesoscale systems as well, like the NAM and the RAP. So you really want to have sufficient um, grid point spacing to at least start to capture these convective processes explicitly uh, without needing deep convective parameterization to accomplish that. Um, and so this obviously allows for improved uh, prediction of these convective modes and structures. There's a lot of uh, users and stakeholders that really need this level of detail and it's inherent that they're also focusing on relatively short um, predictive time scales from hours to several days. Uh, and there's quite a few of them uh, from with the weather service uh, regions and prediction centers. Renewable energy has decision support on the time scale of a day ahead for wind and solar loads. Severe weather outlooks on the first and second days in particular. Um, there's a hydrologic and QPF interests for heavy rainfall and snowfall uh, forecasts, again, as part of the mission of the weather service. Uh, the aviation industry has both tactical and strategic planning that they need to do for the national airspace. Uh, that's also in the day one predictive time scale. So a lot of stakeholder needs uh, are really have to be met with this finer resolution. And I've shown this before, and just to reiterate, um, where we were a couple decades ago in terms of grid resolution uh, and refining that, and this is with the rapid update cycle model uh, that was previously in operations. And this is actually depicting the greater New York City region um, uh, in terms of how that's uh, shown in a land-water interface on the varying grid scales. And so now you can see 
um, you know, the type of fine resolution you get at three kilometer grid spacing um, for features in coastal areas. Obviously, this is helpful in complex terrain as well. Um, but this is a, a demonstration of the, you know, added detail that you get. And obviously, uh, the depiction of convection um, shown cartoon for, form here. But the point is, you want to capture enough grid points across these phenomena that you have some reasonable representation of the processes. Uh, and an example, again, of this is aviation routing um, through convection. Um, if you want to be able to drive uh, aircraft to airports safely um, around weather, obviously the existing um, global and mesoscale regional modeling systems have to parameterize convection. You just don't have the level of detail you need um, to get an idea of convective mode and structure uh, uh, to, for example, route an aircraft to the Newark, Newark airport. So um, you can see that uh, with the three kilometer solutions, we're at least approaching depicting some of those phenomena to understand the, the convective modes and structures. So again, that's a, a, just a reiteration of the motivation for these fine resolution forecasts. We've been implementing uh, RAP HER versions uh, to support uh, these types of uh, capabilities over the years. I think Chandra mentioned that in the introduction um, from what I've been involved with. We've transitioned uh, multiple versions of the RAP HER into operations on roughly a two year cadence, going back to 2014 for the HER and 2012 for the RAP. Um, but at the same time, we've been onboarding other, um, again, stakeholders and communities into the prediction capabilities as we've progressed forward in time including some more recent capabilities such as air quality aspects of just the wildfire smoke prediction, how that interfac interfaces with the meteorology for numerical weather prediction, and then coupling uh, even the Great Lakes temperatures uh, with the FE comm system in the, in the HER version 4 that's about to be implemented. So there's a lot of changes, and I'm not going to spend much more time on the HER version 4 itself because I want to show where we're heading um, with the uh, rapid refresh forecast system, but we do have a package of changes that include data simulation, land surface changes, uh, model physics and dynamic adjustments, as well as post-processing changes that are all part of this comprehensive package for HER version 4 um, that's scheduled for implementation in about a month, uh, give or take. Uh, we're in, uh, starting a 30-day stability test and um, assuming that it completes successfully. Uh, again, we're looking at probably a mid, early to mid-July implementation for HER version 4. But again, back to motivating the high resolution forecasts, I'm showing you, showed you some of the benefits, but here are some of the costs. As we move to finer and finer grid spacings over these last several decades, the compute resources continue to grow uh, and by orders of magnitude in terms of the number of grid points that we have to forecast. And we start considering high resolution ensemble systems at three kilometers. Uh, we're dealing with sort of order billions of grid points that we need to forecast. So the demand uh, is certainly continuing to increase, but of course the supply in terms of computer hardware isn't. It's uh, Moore's law shown here as an idealized um, line, obviously is not holding. And so the demand is far exceeding some of the current compute capacity. Uh, and so that's a challenge for us, but again, also motivating why we're gonna run limited area versions of the FE3. Uh, and this is a test from uh, EMC just showing the benefit if we take a global version of FE3 and produce a regional only version, uh, how much compute savings you can take uh, doing that. Uh, and so basically the limited area, limited area runs are using less than half the tasks um, needed for a nest. This of course would be embedded in a global solution um, for a given amount of time. So um, obviously we really need to be efficient with the compute resources and being able to do that um, with a, lim a standalone regional or limited area model uh, is critical to move this capability forward given the current um, supercomputing resource reality. Um, that said, we want to basically justify the regional capability showing that it at least matches the skill of a finer resolution nest within a global model. Uh, and EMC conducted some uh, uh, testing of this comparison of the regional only versus a comparable re resolution nest in the global version uh, of FE3. And with a MET scorecard, um, basically demonstrated um, equivalent skill across, across uh, different metrics. Precipitation is shown here, uh, and the differences are basically statistically insignificant for a lot of different precipitation thresholds and spatial scales and forecast lengths. So uh, I think we met the, the bar in terms of demonstrating the fidelity of a, a standalone regional version of the FE3 system going forward, um, and that it matches the capabilities of a high-resolution global nest. <clears throat> so again, just, you know, uh, we are moving into this um, 
uh, FE3 realm, there's a lot of different approaches to doing global modeling with a, um, somewhat of an irregular um, grid. Um, obviously, a lat long grid no longer um, suffices for global applications. Um, there's a lot of challenges near the poles with that type of approach. FE3 um, went with a cube sphere solution, um, which again gets around these, these problems you have on a lat long grid for the globe. Um, but what we want to do is take that cube sphere approach and, and, and make a regional version of that uh, that we've done uh, with a lot of collaborative development with EMC, uh, NSSL, uh, GSL, and others, uh, basically taking this FE3 cube sphere, which has a mnemonic projection with it and has numerical attributes that are desirable for flux calculations. Uh, it is a non-orthogonal grid. Um, but again, because of the attributes, um, the fluxes are orthogonal to the model coordinates, and that's a desirable attribute. Um, but what we're doing with the regional-only version, this SAR, uh, is basically creating a seventh tile, if you will, on a six-tile model system, uh, and then taking that tile uh, out uh, and running that alone by itself. Uh, and so um, there's a desire to have grid uniformity across that, that tile. Uh, we want to keep the aspect ratio, cell size, and basically map scale factor variation very small. We want to have uniform grid cell sizes. So there's been a lot of effort to make that a reality. And so in collaboration with um, colleagues, including uh, Jim Purser at EMC, we now have the ability to generate a regional grid with the FE3 system um, that has very uniform grid attributes with it over pretty much any domain that's sub-global. Uh, and so this is an example here, of the blue rectangle showing a um, pretty large domain that one could create, um, but still had uniform grid spacing across that. Um, this is going to be an enhanced um, Schmidt mnemonic grid uh, that's going to be a capability of the uh, FE3 system that's run regionally, that will be a basis for the grids that go into operations with the RRFS. Uh, just to show how that grid spacing compares with other model systems, um, the uh, nest within the global would have a pretty large map scale or grid variation uh, over a pretty big domain if you ran one the size of the basically the NAM or the RAP uh, operationally. The ARW grid has much less um, uh, map scale factor variation and this uh, enhanced uh, mnemonic grid uh, has almost none uh, for a domain of this size. Uh, you can do a smaller domain over the US, similar results there. Um, and so basically uh, you, you minimize the map scale variation uh, with this new uh, grid generation capability within the FE3 system. We've done some tests uh, to generate a grid um, over a whole basin uh, of the Atlantic. Um, and so you can, gen this is a pretty fle flexible tool now to generate grids um, for whatever the user desires to create a regional mesh uh, for whatever the forecast application is. So we've done some testing uh, over um, uh, oceanic basins and in fact, uh, last summer, um, the HAVS um, Hurricane Analysis Forecast System did some demonstrations with the standalone regional capability over, again, the uh, Atlantic Basin uh, and showed um, com comparable forecast skill to a nest within the global system. So that was another promising app application of this regional-only approach. So other aspects of this uh, limited area model, of course, are handling the interface with the exterior domain. Uh, we had to um, work on, again, the courtesy of EMC, um, developing this blending region uh, between the exterior and the interior domain uh, and basically producing an exponential blending function um, that results in a lot better behavior of the flow. Once it comes into the domain, you don't have standing waves um, with a, that can be generated with a more artificial interface. So uh, this is a capability that was recently incorporated into the standalone regional um, code. And so this will be uh, going forward another attribute of this regional system that will be desirable for forecast applications. There's also a workflow that lets you run the standalone regional system end to end um, from, again, creating these um, grid uh, orography files uh, all the way through processing lateral and initial boundary condition and then producing forecasts and post-processing at the end of that. So um, this has also been a collaborative effort with DTC, the Development Testbed Center, and other developers at EMC and GSL, NSSL, to, to produce this regional workflow from end to end um, that's uh, becoming pretty um, user-friendly now in terms of executing the steps to produce, set up a grid and produce a forecast on this regional system. 
So there's a lot of details here about how the workflow executes, and I'm not going to get into uh, much of this at this point. Just suffice to say, we're going to be supporting multiple parent models as inputs um, from the GFS, the RAP, the NAM, the HER to drive this regional only uh, forecast capability. And again, you can set up these grids over CONUS or OCONUS regions uh, to produce forecasts. And so this is a, a nice uh, community uh, uh, collaborative development that I think is gonna make uh, or empower the community to do a lot of different regional forecast tests. So how are we doing with uh, performance of the standalone regional in real-time forecast evaluations? Well, we had a, a spring forecast experiment at the hazardous weather test bed that just concluded uh, that was looking at uh, upwards of um, basically eight different variants uh, or nine different variants of the uh, FE3 regional system. Uh, there are some experiments showing different initial conditions, different lateral boundary conditions, uh, microphysics, and other physics changes between these. Uh, GSL was focusing on um, impacts of initial conditions uh, and one of the different effective options of the FE3 dynamic core as far as its comparisons. And then uh, EMC had some different um, physics configurations they were evaluating as well as data simulation um, impacts in terms of the FE3 forecasts. Uh, NSL again also brought some additional dif different initial condition options to the table um, to do some comparisons for convective forecasts during the month of May. Uh, and this is just an example of one of those afternoons, the 27th of May, uh, looking at uh, forecasted reflectivity. Um, and these are three different EMC and one NSSL configuration in the left four panels compared with observations at right, just showing you the uh, forecast differences of those solutions. Uh, and here are four GSL provided configurations, um, again, uh, compared with observations at lower right. These were 22 hour forecasts uh, and just showing the sensitivities to either initial conditions on the top and bottom or advection options in the left or center columns. Uh, preliminary indications show far more sensitivity to the initial conditions than this advection option, which is certainly a useful piece of information for us to, to, to learn going forward. Um, but the results are of course still preliminary. The experiment just concluded so we don't have a quantitative set of assessments quite yet in terms of uh, the performance of the uh, FE3 regional systems, particularly uh, as it compared to operational or soon to be operational baselines like the HER version four uh, and observations. That said, we are um, looking at verification of the regional uh, solutions of the FE3 system. And here just shown from GSL, four configurations of that uh, regional version. Uh, in yellow, gray, and varying shades of pink and purple. Uh, the, sort of the baselines would be the blue, which is the uh, soon to be operational version of her, her version four, and the current operational version of her in red, her version three, uh, at different forecast lengths. You can see that we're in the ballpark in terms of uh, FE3 SAR forecasts that are initialized from, from the her V4. Um, so that's a nice controlled experiment. Uh, they're just forcing the same initial and boundary conditions. Uh, and so really only looking at dynamic core differences um, as well as just a small difference in the physics. Um, obviously, there's more uh, or reduced error from Rayob verification uh, at low levels in the troposphere compared to mid and upper levels um, when you use the HER initial comparison conditions compared to GFS. But the reverse comes, becomes true uh, in a free atmosphere above the boundary layer uh, as the forecast length grows longer. So that's certainly a common thing that we've seen in the past of the GFS provides pretty high skill in the free atmosphere, particularly at longer forecast lengths um, where a lot of the larger scale information dominates. Uh, again, other verification metrics we can uh, show in terms of looking at wind instead of temperature from Rayobs. Again, pretty competitive um, in terms of the forecast. This is 12 hours at left and 36 at right. Um, and so again, here, I think we're pretty, we're, we're closer in terms of forecast skill between the two model systems. Uh, and then surface metrics of two meter temperature, dew point, and wind. Here it's a function of forecast length over CONUS uh, using METARs for verification during May. Um, again, we sort of we see the most accurate forecasts still coming from the HER, but the uh, the HER initialized uh, FE3 SAR versions are not too far behind at this point. Uh, and then the GFS initialized versions are, are have uh, quite a bit more error into them. But that's expected with some of the existing known um, attributes of the GFS forecast in the boundary layer and surface layer, particularly over uh, mid-latitude CONUS region. 
<clears throat> so this again, just sort of reiterating where we're at in terms of um, where we need to go in terms of matching the operational baseline with this capability. In terms of interfacing data assimilation into the SAR, uh, there's a lot of work that's now ongoing with that as well. We're able to project um, GSI uh, analysis increments into the lateral boundary files um, that, that feed the, the regional FD3 uh, forecast. So um, that interface has now been created as a capability for GSI to update both the entire domain and the lateral boundary uh, data at the same time with EMC's um, work in this front. Um, GSL is looking at uh, building basically some flexibility to the vertical grid generation for the regional capability. Um, for the RFS, we're likely going to have an um, intersection of vertical grid attributes between the NAM and the HER and the GFS. So we would go to a two millibar pressure top and probably have at least 64 vertical levels, maybe upwards of 81 um, between the surface and that two millibar top. Um, and so we would have a higher resolution um, or at least matched vertical resolution of any of the existing NAM, HER, uh, GFS capabilities in the troposphere. And then also looking at the horizontal analysis grid compared to the FE3 system to make sure that we're able to do um, DA where we have a model background as part of the analysis uh, and avoid it where we don't, given the transformation to from a mnemonic grid to an analysis grid that's needed for the FE3 system. We're also coupling in the, the land surface adjustments that we've done with the RAP HER for adjusting soil temperature and moisture based on lower atmospheric uh, information basically model departures from two meter temperature observations that help us basically start in on a coupled soil adjustment um, approach. Again, something the RAP HER has been doing and something we've now established in the FE3 system uh, to be able to adjust the soil state here. We're showing the top soil level temperature increments um, uh, based on the lower row, based on the atmospheric increments at, at the lowest model level uh, in the upper row. So again, just uh, making some adjustments to the soil state based on errors we're seeing or model departures from uh, observations at the lower atmosphere. So some other DA work, EMC is working on testing some different uh, aspects of uh, DA, whether it's a 3D ENVAR, um, both for the, using the global ensemble or a regional ensemble or a combination uh, and comparing some verification metrics against, uh, again, RAOBS uh, using these different DA approaches, looking at root mean square error and biases um, with these different configurations. And so this is just some you know, preliminary work in um, increasing the sophistication of the data simulation that's going to be a part of the, the RRFS system. Uh, there's a lot of other work with Radiance DA development that's going on uh, as well with other collaborators uh, looking at um, bringing in Radiance information over the CONUS um, from a lot of different channels and, and, uh, and different uh, satellite platforms uh, and comparing the, the differences with a cycled version of the, um, the three kilometer RRFS prototype system. And so just some you know, early uh, DA work there. Um, and so some preliminary re uh, results there, again, with the different versions of the DA, whether it be static 3D bar or the different hybrid options uh, with the weighting uh, different for the regional ensemble uh, versus the hybrid mix. Um, and we're just basically some very preliminary results here, um, comparing the differences um, with the hybrid on uh, the mix, uh, there's not a lot of forecast improvement found, but again, very preliminary um, work in this area. I just want to demonstrate the type of DA testing that's now going on um, with this system. So um, a lot more to come on this, uh, but just a demonstration of that. So in terms of physics for the system, um, the RFS is likely uh, going to have a baseline physics configuration that we've uh, had discussions with a lot of uh, developers and colleagues about. Um, we'll be using physics that we're familiar with and comfortable with at CAM scale, but also an eye toward future um, collaboration with uh, the um, medium range applications. So we're looking at the Thomson Microphysics uh, radiation coupled aerosol aware, uh, scale aware MYNN or TMG for radiation, and the NOAA MP for the land surface model. Of course, we're not having deep convection at the three kilometer uh, RFS uh, application. So um, we are going to consider other physics options for parts of the you know, multi-physics ensemble if needed. Um, we certainly would like to get to a position where we have a single model, single physics suite um, for, the, for the RFS capabilities, but um, there's some science challenges there, and so I'll highlight those in a minute um, about um, consolidating toward a single physics, single model approach for the RFS system. We are working on refining the domain for the RFS system. 
taking into account stakeholder input from a lot of different applications, including the FAA, air quality, and others. So we potentially, uh, and of course, HBC resources are going to ultimately dictate what we're going to be able to accomplish. So we have a hope for domain in red. Um, Jacob Carley has been helping facilitate this, um, but we'll have to see what the HBC resources allow, whether it's something smaller than the, the domain in red. The existing operational HER is in yellow rectangle, so it still shows you it's a potentially a quite a significantly larger uh, domain size uh, than the CONUS HER if we go all the way out to the red polygon. So just an example of the type of stakeholder input that we're gathering to determine this CONUS domain size. Um, we are going to be evaluating uh, these forecasts um, against operational model systems as we move to uh, this RFS uh, testing. We're going to be looking at metrics that were agreed upon by stakeholders and collaborators uh, and developers uh, at a workshop a couple years ago, principally focusing on RAOB, METARS, and some MRMS gridded data sets for evaluating the forecast skill of the RFS. Um, we'll be having sort of traditional skill metrics for the continuous fields and the contingency table metrics for the more rare um, cloud and precipitation features. Uh, we'll be using metrics like CSI and bias perform performance diagrams to help inform it, uh, pre operational decision making there. So, in terms of some of the science challenges, first with the, uh, the FE3 SAR, but then more generally for CAM. Um, we're obviously still looking at the behavior of the FE3 system at the convective scale, trying to understand some of the differences with respect to previous operational CAM models like WARF ARW and the NMMB. Uh, we do see some um, larger updrafts in terms of magnitude and distribution in the vertical with the FE3 system at three kilometer scale compared to other modeling systems, uh, as well as some other sensitivities to time stepping, which I've shown here. But again, this is all part of the process of uh, moving toward a new dynamic core for the convective applications and understanding uh, how the model responds and behaves uh, with and without data simulation. And so there'll be more testing of this that continues, but obviously we're looking at it in both idealized and real, real-time data sets at this point to see how it performs. So I wanted to move to the last topic on just some general science challenges we have with CAM forecasts. Uh, and this was one schematic George Bryan presented at the, a workshop in late January. Um, this is inherent for CAM forecasts, whether it be four kilometer grid spacing, one kilometer or even finer, where we still have some systemic biases in the, in the model forecast behavior. Um, even with a three kilometer grid spacing, we have arbitrarily two large updraft widths, um, and that results in um, inaccurate uh, entrainment, uh, detrainment characteristics of the convection. Uh, the cold pools tend to be too weak. The movement of the features can be too slow. As you move toward one kilometer grid spacing, um, the intensity can actually go to the other extreme. You get these very intense localized updrafts uh, with uh, penetration too deep into the uh, upper troposphere, stratosphere. Um, <clears throat> and then an idealized, um, you know, moving down to the hundreds of meters um, gets away from these classes of problems, but obviously becomes extremely expensive to be able to achieve. And so, we have to work with sort of three kilometer grid spacing uh, and do what we can to reduce model biases at that scale. One of which is um, the emphasis of subgrid scale clouds in physics. Uh, we obviously have explicit um, cloud hydrometeors and precipitation hydrometeors, but a lot of research and development is going into parameterizing, so to speak, unresolved cloud fields, these subgrid clouds um, where we use PDFs basically to adjust to a, based on the environment to assess the amount of parameterized cloud mass uh, that's present, uh, again, on a subgrid scale. So that's an ongoing development activity. Um, some of these efforts have already made it into to HER version 3 and now uh, refinements into HER version 4. Um, and those are highlighted here, uh, where, again, we're trying to bring in the subgrid scale clouds to capture some of these phenomenon uh, that aren't explicitly resolved by the microphysics scheme. Uh, and adjustments we've made to the effective radii and mixing ratios of the sub subgrid sub clouds to improve cloud retention and the impact on the meteorology, uh, particularly in shallow um, cloudy air masses. So this is an ongoing effort, but some key changes that are going into her version four. We can also still see these systemic errors by um, basically looking at verification of um, incoming shortwave radiation. Uh, so here we're just looking at SURFRAD sites across the U.S., downward shortwave radiation biases compared to those observations. 
uh, the work that we've done with her version four and the subgrid clouds have reduced those incoming shortwave radi radiation biases compared to the operational HER, but they're still excessive. We still have a high bias, and this is an ongoing, again, physics challenge really at the three kilometer scale, um, which is inherent to, like I said, all CAMs. It's not specific to the HER, but something we have to continue to work on to, to, to appropriately characterize those subgrid features and sub subgrid cloud features. So just showing some examples here of what that looks like when you simulate um, top of the atmosphere long wave um, radiative fluxes, uh, compare that to goes visible. Um, and you can see the um, differences in terms of, um, sorry, this is upward short wave, not long wave, um, differences in terms of the um, cloud mass and having better representation of that distribution of the cloud fields. And in this case, off the west coast of, uh, of California and Mexico, um, and uh, obviously you have a pretty substantial cloud field there from GOES observations. So getting these physical processes uh, more accurately depicted on a three kilometer grid, is pretty important. Other biases that we're dealing with, storm motion. Um, this was an analysis by Corey Potvin at NSSL, comparing the distribution of observed storm convective elements. Uh, this is on a Windrose diagram showing the observations at upper left, that distribution for 95 cases compared to different FE3 or ARW configurations uh, at anomaly three kilometer grid spacing. Um, and you can see that there are differences, um, significant in terms of the bias of storm motion. Generally speaking, for more intense convective uh, cells, uh, we don't have uh, enough rightward motion. We don't slow down enough compared to observations um, for these systems. So that's an inherent bias that we see across a lot of these CAMs. So it's just an example of some of the challenges that we have. And that has an impact, obviously, in predicting the location of pending severe weather if we don't accurately capture those biases. Uh, another is with data simulation, trying to retain cloud information. And here are just bias of cloud mass at different heights so using METAR accelerometers, going from forecast hour zero outward. And these are her forecasts, where you see very quickly an adjustment of the amount of cloud mass happening. Um, we wanna keep a bias close to one, but obviously there's a lot of work going on with the data simulation, not all of which is retained at this point. And so that's a challenge of, retaining analysis features such as discrete clouds into the forecast as it freely evolves. So that's just an ongoing science challenge as well. The last challenge I'll mention before I wrap up is, again, back on a CAM ensemble design where we really wanna to move toward with the RFS, a single dynamic core, single physics capability if we can. A step in that direction has been the development of the HER um, data simulation ensemble system or HERDAS, 36 members that were advancing hourly uh, using GDAS perturbations periodically and then doing an ENKF solver on two scales to advance the solution. We subset from the 36 members to produce nine member uh, forecasts out to um, 36 hours. And so that's the application of just a single model ensemble design that we want to see how that stacks up against multi-model ensemble approaches like the current operational baseline with HREP uh, and see how we can um, basically reach that goal of having similar spread skill um, to the HREF system or comparable. Um, but there are other applications for an ensemble data simulation system at convective scale, future applications for a worn on forecast, as well as the mesoscale analysis and improvements itself in the deterministic HER. Uh, I've shown this, I think, elsewhere. This is an example of using the HERDAS system on the left compared to a, a no storm scale ensemble leveraging it right. For one case last year, we had training convective complexes across the US. Um, the HERDAS system provided some better initial condition and um, storm scale um, covariances to give a better depiction and evolution of that convective system compared to using basically just the global ensemble uh, GDAS. In a high, both of these are hybrid forecasts um, using part static, but uh, again, HERDAS mean for the initial state on left as well as HERDAS background error covariances. The, again, operational baseline for convective scale ensembling is the HREF, this multi-model ensemble. They're a bunch of basically a bunch of control members, uh, some of which are time lag, different dynamic cores, physics, and initial conditions that drive an HREF forecast. HREF version two is currently operational that leverages um, basically four different individual members, each of which is time lagged. We're going to transition that to HREF version three replacing the um, NMMB members with the FE3 SAR. That'll be the first operational implementation of the SAR. Uh, and then uh, we're also incorporating the deterministic HER as other members for HF version three. And so this is a 
is a competitive ensemble system. Uh, and like I said, I've sort of highlighted the changes that are going in for version three, as well as some additional post-processing ensemble agreement scale techniques. I won't go into the details of that here. But the challenge, of course, is can we get to a comparable scale with a single model ensemble design? The hurry is sort of a test bed for that to compare with HREF. Subjectively, last year in the 2019 hazardous weather test bed experiment, um, it wasn't viewed as favorably, the hurry that is, or any of the other ensembles as HREF. This is a subjective verification. Um, there are some other metrics that can be used to show the differences. This is another example of a, a single case study comparison in the test bed last year. Uh, capturing all the severe weather reports between the HER ensemble, a couple of other ensemble systems that were run experimentally for the test bed, as well as HREF. Uh, and HREF, you know, subjectively is, is viewed to be superior. Uh, I think we have some objective scores that show similar results, but I think we are closing the gap with HURI. Um, this is an objective measure of precipitation skill from HURI and HREF, uh, looking at uh, th different thresholds, just basically bias characteristics um, exceeding those particular thresholds over the entire summer of 2019. Um, but one of the attributes that we want to get away from is having different member biases in the HREF that you don't have in a HER ensemble. So you have diverse member solutions with HREF, some of which have high biases. They're not all equally likely. Uh, we want to have much more equal likelihood, at least to where sample sizes can measure that. Um, which would be the left of this vertical line compared to the right where you have, again, a few of the members that have very high biases of precipitation. So you have very you have bias that's driving some of the spread that you really don't want to use for sources of spread in the system. The challenge with a single model ensemble system is you tend to have not enough spread um, and therefore the event itself happens outside of the PDF, so to speak, of the, uh, um, the model solution space. Uh, and so you really have an under dispersion, under dispersion problem with a single model ensemble system that we're trying to get uh, past. Uh, and we're using stochastic physics approaches to do that, both with parameter perturbation and tendency perturbations. Uh, and so I'll just skip some of this and I'll think you want to get to that. Here's the stochastic parameter perturbation and tendency perturbations that we're now deploying in the HER ensemble, where we're increasing the total spread. So it's the solid line compared to what we had previously in the dash line with just the parameter perturbation alone. But at the same time, the total error of the ensemble in blue or the biases in red are really unchanged. And so we're really trying to drive more spread without driving the bias. Uh, so we want to drive, we want to draw spread from uh, uncertainties of the day and not bias of individual members. Uh, and the other aspect of this is how fast we can run the ensemble system, subsetting observational data, cutting it off very quickly for these regional applications like RFS, where we might have a data cut off as short as five minutes after the top of the hour to produce these forecasts. And we can quantify, at least for short forecast lengths, minimal impact with an earlier observation dump. So last slide, uh, really on just where we're going. Uh, standalone regional FE3 capabilities are going to be released as part of a public release um, this November. Uh, we won't have data simulation in that initial capability, but we will have this ESG grid that I talked about early in the talk as well as different initialization options and physics suites for uh, initializing the SAR. Um, we are shooting for, like I said, upcoming code freeze and then eventual public release of this UFS application uh, on about the 2nd of November. Um, there are some resources here in terms of the uh, Confluence website for what the CAM application team is working on, as well as a forum that the community can engage with for questions and concerns and other things about the short range weather applications. So, we're going to shoot for an RFS implementation in 2023. Um, we're having the final HER version 4 implementation here in quarter three, um, and the final HREF implementation now going to be in quarter one of FY21. Uh, and that will freeze out all the non RFS UFS CAM applications. And then we'll start with the RFS V1 in 2023. So, with that, I will stop and see if there's time for discussion and questions. Thank you, Curtis. Um, Curtis, I, I see there's a question in the question box uh, by Daniel. Uh, what's the QPF matrix, what skill measure is? Matrix. Um, Maybe we can unmute Daniel. Um, Bhavana, can you unmute?
I'm not sure the question. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what they're asking either, but um, I mean, we have. Okay, I don't seem. Bhavana, can you unmute Daniel? I mean, there are metrics that are going to be used for um, verifying the CAM skill. We're looking at one, six, and 24 hour precipitation amounts using stage four data principally for validation. And we'll be um, computing. Yeah, you showed, uh, um, Curtis, you showed a, a BC, it was a BC matrix. Uh, and, and I think it had on the first column a bunch of QPF thresholds. And I, I did reach to understand what was in it. W would you mind maybe um, telling me something? I don't, I don't remember that. I, I think it was earlier. Um, I think it was earlier than that, around the 20s or so. Okay. Keep going. I'll let you know. Where? Yeah, where? keep going back. Oh, here. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically, they're computing. Um, I think in this case, it's fractional skill score that's being computed on different spatial grids from five kilometers to 148 kilometers uh, at different precipitation thresholds from two millimeters through 10 millimeters. So that's the parameter space that was used to validate the SAR, the standalone regional versus a nest in the global. Um, so it's fractional skill score that's being computed for those precip thresholds. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Um, we can unmute. I don't seem to be able to unmute at all. Yeah, I'm trying to find Cliff Mass, um, but one of the questions he asked was, uh, did you ever resolve the question about the impact of the degrid on FE3? There were concerns about that. So that goes to the um, testing that's going on and in two fronts. One is these real data simulations where we're looking at um, the distribution of things like vertical velocity and pressure uh, distributions. Um, again, both compared to um, observations and things like the spring forecast experiment where we have a large sample size of FD3 forecasts to see um, how those differ from other model systems like WARF ARW. And then there's a class of idealized testing that's underway. Lou Wecker uh, at NSSL has been leading that to look at the FD3 system and how it performs in an idealized sense, again, with vertical velocity structures, um, pressure, vertical pressure distributions, and ensuing downstream differences for convective structures. Um, I don't think at this point I want to make a definitive statement about, you know, the, the difference between, D, you know, the, the D grid versus the C grid approach um, of the ARW system. Um, so I think there's still testing going on there to understand uh, the difference in behavior between those two um, approaches to the grid staggering. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at this in that, you know, we have the, we have the intent of replacing these CAM systems like the HER and, and, the, and the NAMNES with our FS, uh, FE3-based system. But we have a lot of metrics of, that I've highlighted here that we're going to be looking at um, subjectively and objectively to make a determination of whether we're matching the skill of things like the HER and the NAMNES. If we don't match it, we're going to have to do something to get there. We're not going to just replace those systems with something that we can quantify is not matching its skill. So, um, you know, we, the, the measure and, and the, you know, the, the charge is on us to make sure that we're, you know, at least comparable in terms of skill with, with these different metrics. Uh, and if it's not, then we'll, we'll revisit the decision process for where we need to go with the RFS design. Um, so, um, you know, we're not going to implement just for implementation's sake. So Curtis, there's been no clean comparison at this point between FB3 and WARF with the same physics, just to show that that the D grid is not a problem. So there are there are like I said, two fronts of comparisons happening there. One is here, um, and I don't have in this panel mosaic the Hervey four forecasts, for example, that you could which we did have access to. They're just not in the same 
panel subset here. Um, so basically you have at lower left and lower middle per initialized FE3 forecasts. And then we could also put in this matrix, the ARW forecast from Hervey for itself. So then you basically have for all intents and purposes, only a dichord difference uh, in terms of the forecast. So those were being looked at in the spring experiment, like I said, just not encapsulated in this particular graphic matrix. Um, so we have a, a, we're accumulating real-time comparisons of the FE3 forecast at three kilometers that are controlled and do have those differences in place of just the dynamic core. Um, and then at the same time, like I said, we have idealized tests that Lou is helping lead, um, again, with a controlled comparison between um, the ARW and the FE3 system to look at its behavior for idealized, you know, convective scenarios where you have buoyancy in a sheared environment. Right. So we're, we're going to have report outs on those, you know, forthcoming. I think Lou already had one presentation on that. Um, but there's there's going to be a report out from the spring forecast experiment, how we're doing compared to the her baseline, as well as that idealized testing. And that's going to tell us, you know, where we're at, how far do we need to go to, to match that system. Um, next question is from Dine. Dine, can you say that? Can you? So what was your decision-making process for releasing a public version of the SAR FV3 before operational implementation? That's from Dine. So um, I think there's there's advantages to having a public release of this system. Um, let me go to the last slide for that. Um, because, I mean, we're a ways off from an operational implementation of, uh, of the FV3. As I mentioned, the RFS, we're not really looking at operational implementation until 2023 um, at the earliest. Uh, and so um, I think there's opportunity, you know, with a public release uh, sooner rather than later um, to do two things. One, start the process of engaging uh, the community and looking at this, this model system uh, and get, you know, some collaborative, um, you know, input on that to help move the RFS system forward. The more people we have using this this framework uh, and model system, the better. So I think having that happen uh, at, you know, at an intermediate time scale um, before an operation release is, is certainly justified. And it also lets us, you know, because we have a, the, the global release obviously happened back in March. Um, and this gets us at least keeping the um, some measure of consistency between these applications. If, if we're di disciplined about having releases of these applications um, happening, you know, in a yearly cadence or every other year type cadence, uh, if we were just to defer the regional release for a long period of time, I think there would be, um, you know, a potential for more divergence of these applications than um, if we go through this process of, of keeping this on a regular cadence. So, um, and so again, we'll, we'll have broader community engagement in the development process. Uh, and then, like I said, stay more coordinated across the UFS applications by having this regular release. And so I think we'll learn and benefit from having more people you know, using this system. So we didn't want to release it too soon because obviously we want to be, you know, we didn't want to put an inferior product out there. So we did already delay the release um, by a couple of quarters. Um, again, we're not going to make a release for release sake. So um, we want to make sure we at least have a foundational set of capabilities um, that will make this system usable and, um, you know, engageable by the community to help us with the development process going forward. Yeah, that's excellent. That's also Dine's second question. So you are going to cooperate uh, the helps from the community to improve the next uh, operational implementation. So we have sure. one minute left. Uh, there's another question from Jack King. Uh, Curtis, excellent presentation. Can you elaborate on the modifications needed to add additional soil layers and uh, what what do you expect to gain from that? Um, so this is on the physics question. Um, so let me see if I can find that slide. But the point is, yes, we're obviously um, wanting to um, with the physics, there we go. Um, we want to move toward NOAA MP as a land surface model system. We know that's the direction that the global system is heading in. Um, it hasn't gotten there yet either. 
um, but having a common um, infrastructure for a land surface model, I think is gonna help us with uh, physics development across scales in the future. Um, that said, um, the question about having more vertical levels, um, I think the issue is that um, I th there needs to be some flexibility here such that the thermal inertia um, of the land surface model doesn't become prohibitive in terms of the depth of those layers. Uh, and so you wanna have an appropriate um, response uh, time, obviously, in the land surface model to all the fluxes uh, into the lower boundary uh, that we've, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, work done over the years, obviously, with the RUC system and its nine levels. It's not paramount that we have nine for no MP, but I think we wanna at least think about having appropriate vertical specifications so that, again, the thickness of those layers um, gives you a, a reasonable response time to, um, you know, radiative forcing and other fluxes into it. So, uh, and then the other aspect is there's a multiple um, levels, there's a two layer snow model with the rock, which has its own benefits for handling, um, you know, how the snowpack evolves and the, the impacts that has on um, fluxes into the boundary layer, particularly in the cold season. So there's, you know, attributes of that capability that I think we want to bring in. Um, and so it's just that I toward having a community based um, land surface model approach um, where I think we can leverage a lot of the existing and previous work, uh, uh, but get everybody using the same type of land surface model for all these different UFS applications. So that's about you know, all I can say on that. Yeah. Can, can we have a time, uh, maybe just quick, there one more last question um, from uh, Kushner. Have you performed any impact of the initial conditions with the FA3SAR on the aircraft data uh, since the COVID-19 era? The aircraft data, ACRS, CAMDAR. Yeah, ACRS. yeah um, we have, and there have been not only previous studies on the loss of aircraft data uh, in terms of deg degradation and forecast skill, um, but we continue to monitor that in real time GSL has some verification that we do regularly to look at degradation and forecast skill and tracking the OBS counts for things like aircraft data. Um, we haven't done that yet with the FE3 SAR system uh, regionally, so we don't have FE3-based statistics, but we would have every reason to believe that what we're seeing with the current you know, ARW-based systems in terms of loss and forecast skill is gonna be comparable because it's a data assimilation problem in general. Loss of aircraft data leads to lower forecast skill I'll say just a, one more thing about that, that it, it, this, we haven't had a total loss of aircraft data. It's been significantly reduced, but it's non-zero. Um, and so the impacts of that in the, in the forecast accuracy have been fairly muted. Um, so it's not like what we had back on 9-11 where we had a complete shutdown of the airspace uh, and a complete loss of aircraft data. So we're not seeing forecast skill degradation uh, of that magnitude. It's possible in particular cases and events, the, the impact might be greater with, with the reduction in aircraft data that we're seeing. But on the whole, if you're just from the aggregate statistics of things like upper level verification against RAOBS, et cetera, um, we're not seeing significant loss in forecast skill at the level of loss of the aircraft data that we have now. But we do know it does happen if you continue to, to reduce the aircraft head count. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, Curtis, um, we we are uh, like three minutes, four minutes over the four p.m. Uh, I think uh, we had a successful webinar. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, please uh, send us uh, feedback and comments. Uh, we are try to improve this uh, this time. Um, and also remember to recommend the speakers uh, if you uh, are there any significant works. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you again for the opportunity to present today. And uh, if there's any more questions, people could certainly send me an email, curtis.alexander at noaa.gov, um, and I'd be happy to entertain those offline. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to, to talk about where we're at with the short range weather application. <laughs>